We're beginning a new series this morning called Conversations, and we want to talk about conversations that we could have with God. We're going to begin in Gospel of John, chapter 10. Jesus is speaking to some people who have some very restricted and limited views about what God has had to say, who he speaks to, and what he means. And so Jesus begins this chapter by saying, very truly, I tell you, Pharisees. So he's, he's specifically targeting people who assume they've actually heard everything God has to say. And they know everything that God wants to communicate. Anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because... They do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Does God speak to people? Well, that's a controversial question. There are some people who think that anyone who claims to hear God speak to them might be emotionally or mentally unbalanced. I went to visit someone in a very secure institution that was designed for people who struggle with the most severe kinds of, of mental illness. And in order to see this person, I had to go through a lot of security checkpoints. I had, to, I had to, to make sure that I was searched so I wasn't taking anything in. It was a very secure environment. And before I could see the person that I was visiting, I had to talk to the head psychiatrist of the institution. And the question she asked me was, do you believe that God speaks to you? And when she asked the question, I began to count in my mind all the doors that I did not have a key to to get back out of if I answered the question in a way that she didn't think was good. I actually answered the question according to the way I think and believe, and we, we wound up having a really engaging conversation. But some people think if you claim to hear from God, there's something wrong with you. Other people claim that the voice of God is so common in their life, he tells them what to order on their menu when they're in a restaurant or what shirt or color shirt to wear today. And some people think that what God has said is completed in Scripture. There's nothing to be added to it. When the last period was given in the last sentence in the book of Revelation, God has had nothing more to say. I think you can read Scripture and memorize a lot of facts, but that doesn't mean that you will succeed in your faith. I think we can get good enough to pass a test on historical accounts, but that doesn't mean that we know how to follow God. So this morning, I'd like to focus on this. Does God speak to people? And the first thing is, is that God is not silent. The most important skill in communication, the most important skill in relationship is listening. It's hard. It's hard to do. It's easy to assume that prayer is only about prayer speeches to God. We let him know what we need and what we want. By the way, nothing wrong with that. But conversations, when we're done with that, the conversation is over. Conversations that only have one person talking are not conversations. By the way, they're not enjoyable either. I mean, it's possible that we don't enjoy prayer because we're the ones doing all the talking. Don't get me wrong, I know some people who are really good at talking. But if you're responsible for all of the conversation, even if you're an extrovert, that can feel wearying over time. When you examine scripture, there's actually quite a few examples of God speaking to lots of different people in lots of different ways. And it seemed to occur in all across times and genders. It was just unbelievable how reckless God seems and who he's willing to talk to. And sometimes there's very specific directions that God gives. I want you to go to this specific place at this specific time and do this specific thing. And for lots of us, that's the kind of guidance we assume we prefer. Just tell me what I'm supposed to do, when I'm supposed to do it, where I'm supposed to do it, I'm good. But that might be the lowest level of guidance that there is in all of Scripture. It's almost like a programming 
concept. And in fact, there's all kinds of guidance that we can receive in our life when someone who cares about us and is wise has some conversations with us and they open our eyes maybe to some things about ourselves or how we're perceiving the things around us. And out of that wisdom and that insight, we begin to see things differently, see different options to exercise. And we wind up at the same place as if somebody gave us specific directions. But God didn't coerce our thoughts in order to get us there. That's a really important concept. This is what it says in Psalm 32. It says, Do not be like the horse or the mule, which has no understanding but must be controlled by a bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. God says, Don't be like the mule. Don't do that, where the only thing you can respond to is an outside force that requires you to do something. God considers us intelligent people, and he wants to reason with us. In fact, just look at the person next to you, give your best smile, and tell them, you are an intelligent person. Go ahead, just say that, all right? Just tell them. Some of you are expanding. <clears throat> in Psalm 32, verse 8, it says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with, the, with my loving eye on you. I will counsel you with my loving eye. That, that's a really interesting concept. How do you counsel someone with your eye? Well, what I can tell you is you can communicate a lot with a look, can't you? Yes. I mean, if you're married, your spouse can give you a look that tells you, hmm, this could be an interesting and romantic evening. Or they could give you a look that says, I've never been more embarrassed in my life. And how many can tell the difference between those looks? If your hand's not up, it explains a lot of things. <laughs> not only do we read a look that someone has, but sometimes we can notice what they're focused on and paying attention to, and that gives us information on something we can do. If you notice something someone really loves or likes, it might inform you as something you can do for them. See, God doesn't just love us. He does, but not only us. He loves everyone. Everyone in our community, everyone on our planet. We need to notice that. In fact, if you're wondering if we do, that whole big construction project you see out front of this place, it's because we believe that God loves not just the people in the room, but everyone in our community, and we want to create space. If, if you were around here at the Christmas Eve services, particularly the 4 o'clock service, we had no chairs left, and, and we had people standing in the back and out in the lobby, and we want them to feel welcome, and it's hard to feel welcome when there's no seat. And so we're trying to create space. That's the goal. So we want to notice what God notices. Now, there are lots of interesting ways that God has communicated with people. And uh, how he kind of set up that communication with Moses. There was a bush that was burning but was not consumed. Moses actually turned aside. He, he walked over to go see what this strange sight was. And as a result, he had an encounter with God. Abraham saw some people walking by. He didn't realize that they were angels, but he invited them into his tent. And the result was he wound up having an encounter with God. Paul had a, a vision, a, a mental image of a man from a specific location asking for help from Macedonia, and Paul took that image seriously enough that he went to that location and wound up planting a church there. Samuel, a little boy in the Old Testament, just when he was very young, thought he heard the voice of God, and his response was to ask God to speak to him, and the results not only shaped his life, it changed a nation. Elijah was a guy, a very complicated personality. He'd been through a series of events that had drained him to the point that he actually didn't want to live anymore. Just think about that. Somebody who knows God so well, he hears his voice, and yet had gotten so fatigued, he just didn't want to do this anymore. Not just retire. Just, just not be. And so he goes to a cave to rest. And while he's there, Scripture tells us that there was a great wind that came along. Not just a, a strong wind, the kind of wind that tears things apart. It actually moved and broke rocks. And Elijah saw this, and, and he said, but God was not in the wind. And then the earth began to violently shake underneath his feet. There was this huge earthquake, and, and it just it shook. Nothing seemed stable. It's like the ground was becoming 
liquid. It was just moving all over the place. And he said, but God was not in the earthquake. And then there was an explosion of fire that just consumed everything in its path, just, just laying waste to anything that was combustible. And he said, but God was not in the fire. And then he heard this gentle internal whisper. And when he heard that, he covered his face with his cloak and he walked to the mouth of the cave and he had a conversation with God. I wonder how often God wants to speak to us. Sometimes we don't hear God, but it's not because he has nothing to say or isn't trying to say it. Sometimes it's just we don't agree with him. It's really hard to hear something you don't agree with. So not only is God not silent, that leads us to this point, and that is he will not shout. God is not going to try to out-scream you. He's not going to try to bully you. He's not going to try to impose something on you. He just simply invites us to consider his ways. There's a, a thing called facial recognition software. And it can be something as, some of your phones have this, right? And so you can actually hold your, your phone up like this and it will unlock because it recognizes your face. When you first got that phone, in order for that feature to work, you had to stare at it and show your phone all different kinds of angles and, and then it would recognize you. And, and by the way, that's not just for opening smart devices. This facial recognition software that if you are going to fly from one point of our country to another point and you walk into an airport, they've got cameras that can identify if you're on a list they don't want you flying on. And it doesn't matter what your identification says or what your ticket name says. If you walk up and you've been identified, they've, they've got that software. Jesus doesn't just talk about facial recognition. He talks about voice recognition. It's a really interesting concept. Voice recognition. That it's possible to know who it is you're talking to by recognizing their voice even if you can't see their face. Even animals can be trained to voice recognition, to, command all, to follow only the commands of a specific individual or person. But it takes a lot of time to train an animal to do that. Uh, we have a, a little dog that was given to me on Father's Day. Not particularly because I wanted that little dog, but that was the gift, and so it is now mine. And, uh, and uh, what I will tell you is it's a very little dog, and uh, it, it's by no means the smartest little creature we've ever had in our house. And, um, and, and, and I can also tell you that it has virtually no sense of loyalty. It will go to your house today. It will, it will go home with you. And, like, if you will feed it and you will give it attention, that's all that's required. It's in constant need of attention. It just it, it never wants to be left alone, unpetted, ignored in any way. It, it just constantly needs attention. Now, what I can tell you, though, is that if you came over to our house, it would immediately go to you. And if you would pet it, it would stay there until, until your hand fell off of your body. And it has a nasty little habit. It will lick. And it will lick until its tongue bleeds. It just it will not stop. And, and so it'll, it'll be licking someone, and I'll say, stop licking. And, and, and she stops because she recognizes my voice. By the way, if you call her and I call her at the same time, she will obey me. She also shakes her head when she does it. I'm not making that up. It's, it's like having a, a, a little toddler in the house, you know, just, it, no. And, but uh, This is what it says in Isaiah. It says, the ox knows its master and the donkey its owner's manger, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. That regular exposure and interaction of a farmer with farm animals helps them know what to expect and even know what to do. And what God is telling us in that passage of Scripture is that if we're willing to be attentive, we can learn to hear his voice just over time. See, that means that learning to hear God's voice requires time and practice. This isn't an instant thing. There, there's not a certain decibel level or reverb level that identifies this is how you know God is speaking. It's not how he won't be limited to that kind of constraint. Now, we don't always recognize God's voice in our life. Some people actually try to find ways to recognize, and, and some people assume this. If something is happening in my life, it must be God's will. That everything that happens in our world is God's will. There are people who hold to that. 
And if it's a circumstance that I'm facing, then it must be God's will for my life. And God can speak through our circumstances. I believe that's possible. But are we willing to say that every circumstance is the voice of God in our life? If there's an open door, do I have to go through every open door that is open before me? And if not, how do I know which ones to go through and which ones not to go through? Am I supposed to marry the first person I see? I don't recommend it. Are we supposed to attend the first school that accepts us? Are we supposed to take the first job of the company that will hire us? Are we supposed to see things that seem unfair and unjust in our world and just accept that that's God's will and never try to make a difference and never try to make an improvement? If circumstances are always God's will, we don't even need scripture. Because God's will has already been decided by circumstances. Now, God can use circumstances. But it might be wise when we face options or challenges, when we have opportunities or opposition, to include a conversation with God where he can give us insight to understand what direction we should be considering, what options we might want to exercise. It's really easy just to assume, well, I'd rather not feel responsible for something, so I'll just say whatever happens is God's will. But I think there's a lot of wisdom in learning to discern God's voice in the midst of challenges. Paul actually indicates to us that not only is Scripture inspired and, and given by inspiration of God, it wasn't just smart people who were, who, who were creative and, and giving us good information. He said it was inspired by God. But if the writing of it needs to be inspired, maybe the hearing of it needs to be inspired too. Otherwise, we're just reduced to facts and regulations. We can learn to discern God's voice. So it's amazing what people say that they've heard when, when I speak. I've had people come out and they say, you know, you know when you said that thing? And it's, it's actually one of the smallest, most forgettable points of the entire message, but it's what resonated with them. They go, oh, wow, that, that really stood out to them. That's great. But then I have people who tell me that I said something that I didn't say. <laughs> I actually didn't say it. I know I didn't say it. My, my messages are far more transcripted than people realize. You don't know, but there's, there's 18 pages of notes for today's talk. And you're probably wondering what page we're on. <laughs> I'm going to give you hope. Page 13. <laughs> there are people that will say, and, and that used to drive me nuts. I, I used to think, why aren't they putting words in my mouth? I didn't say that. And then it occurred to me, what if God were speaking to them? And I was getting credit for it. <laughs> that maybe while you're listening to me talk, God comes in and on an internal channel of your heart and your spirit, he begins to convey information and insight and understanding into something that actually helps you. And it wasn't because I uttered the words, but you heard them. That'd be a really cool thing. So, so hearing is going to require time and practice, but hearing God doesn't mean that it eliminates your decision making. See, we don't just throw out decisions to God and then he tells us exactly what to do every time. And, and we don't just toss a coin to decide how that's going to go. You see, God wants us involved in decision-making. He's not going to bully us. He's not going to remove our will. By the way, he's not going to contradict himself either, which is why we spend as much time as we do around here on Sundays trying to decipher and discern what God's word says because God's will can be understood in his word, and if we feel like he's saying something to us, this is a great assessment tool to work that by because there are some things God won't say. If, even if you hear someone say, God told me, which is, by the way, you know, some people do this with a kind of reckless abandon that makes me uncomfortable. They play the God told me card. God told me to tell you. That makes me a little bit anxious. Because I, I'd love to have God affirm and confirm things through other people. But I don't want to assume that I can't hear him for myself either. 
So we spend a lot of time in Scripture because the more we learn about how God has spoken to people, it informs us about things he might say to us. Now, God is not going to exempt us from challenges. Certainly there are things that can be avoided in life through wise counsel, but there, there are other things that may cost us dearly. It was the will of God that Jesus embrace and endure the cross. Hearing his father did not exempt him from that. Peter knew that if he kept preaching the gospel, he was going to be in prison. He preached the gospel anyway. He didn't consider hearing God as a way to get out of things that hurt or are heavy. So I'd like to just take the last couple of minutes of our time together. By If you were going to take a few minutes with God, how might you do that? What might that look like? And so the first thing I'd, I'd recommend is that you just take a minute to be quiet. Just take a minute to be quiet, which always feels a lot longer than you think it does. If I were to set a timer right now for one minute and ask everyone to be quiet for one minute, first of all, it's highly unlikely we could do it. And secondly, that minute would feel way longer. Like some of you would start checking your own watches and smart devices to see how long was actually being taken. But just take a moment and be quiet and ask God. Just say, God, I want you to open my heart and my mind to anything you have to say. And just be quiet for a minute. And then I recommend that you read a passage of scripture, but read it slowly. Speed reading doesn't necessarily embed anything deeply into our hearts or to our minds. Read it slowly. And then this will feel like a little bit of a, a grammatical mistake, but read the passage again and listen. What, what I mean by that is as you're reading the passage a second time, just pay attention to any words or phrases that seem to stand out to you. Something might just seem a little bit more significant. What could that be? More importantly, what could that mean? Which is why the next thing is just to reflect on why that stood out. If that word or that phrase stood out, what might be happening in, in my life right now that God wants to connect with that insight and what I'm facing? And then it's also good to ask God what you need to know or be or do. Is there something that you don't know or understand about a situation? That insight can make all the difference. Is there, is there something you need to be? And, and some people just think, well, just be better. No, 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 no. Maybe I need to be a little more compassionate. Maybe I need to be a little more patient. Maybe I need to be a little bit more tender or kind or generous. And just ask God, what do I need to be? Is there, is there an action step to take? Is, is there something that I can do? And, and here's what I want to tell you. Don't assume that every thought you have is God. That would be a mistake. But it's also a mistake to assume that no thought you have could be God. Why not give a chance to find out, could God be speaking something into my life? And then just end the way you begin. Just end the way you begin. Just take a moment and be quiet. God is, is loving and he wants to be helpful. He desires to straighten the things that feel crooked in our lives. He desires to provide wisdom to what seems confusing in our life. And he wants to correct things that are wrong in our life. I know there are lots of people, well, if you start trying to hear the voice of God, you're going to, to, to fall off the deep end. Why are we never worried about following, falling off the shallow end? Do you really think our world has benefited by misunderstanding or shallow understanding of what God wants to do in our lives. See, Jesus came to restore a relationship with us. How can there be a relationship if there's no communication? Let's bow our heads this morning. Now, I'm, I'm well aware that there's some people in the room like this is something you've already been engaged in for a long time. And so you really didn't hear anything new today. So for you, I hope that this day just serves as an encouragement, a reminder, as we launch into a new year and a new decade. Um, continue to take that time to try to hear what God might be speaking to you. 
for the others of you, the whole concept of thinking that God could speak directly to you seems a little uncertain or uncomfortable. But it is where the adventure of your faith will be found. You being able to memorize the names of people who lived long ago in lands far away or to know the dates won't necessarily change your life. But if you can learn to hear the voice of the one who spoke to them, it can make all the difference. Some of us have bits and bridles in our mouths. There are things that other people have spoken into our lives and they defined us. They might have been well-intended or maybe they intended harm. But every time we come to certain opportunities or situations, it's like someone's got a rein on us and they just pull hard in one direction and we veer off. We're never able to break away from it. If you'd like to be free to find out where it is God would like you to go, maybe the way is not just in being frustrated by what someone else said into your life, but to hear a fresh and new voice in your life from your Father who will take off the bit and the bridle of those who have exercised such control and lead you into the full freedom he has for you. Father, help us with that today. I know there have been lots of words spoken to us and about us, and that can have a very limiting and restricting thing, an influence in our lives. But today we want to hear your voice. Lead us. Guide us. Speak to us. We are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.